Hey guys, uh, this is a continuation of individual module 5.2 uh, and this is lecture 2 and we're going to start with uh, talking about the stages of labor and then finish up PowerPoint 1 um, and this recording is being made um, fall semester of 2019. Okay, so let's talk about the first stage of labor. Um, labor has four stages, and we'll talk about each one of them and what occur in each stage. Um, we'll start out with the first stage, and the first stage of labor occurs from the onset of labor until complete cervical dilation. So again, 10 centimeters. There are three phases that happen in the first stage of labor. There is a latent phase where the mom has mild to moderate uterine contractions. She is somewhere between either zero to three centimeters dilated. And her contractions are lasting um, around 30 seconds and they're anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes apart. But, but kind of regular. Um, usually this stage lasts several hours, um, somewhere on an average between 5.3 to 8.6, and uh, you don't have to know the specifics of those hours. I really want you to focus on the strength of the contractions that happen in each phase and uh, the centimeters that the cervix is dilated. So in the latent phase, this is the beginning of regular contractions. They're usually pretty mild, and throughout the latent phase, they increase in frequency, duration, and intensity. Um, the cervix starts to dilate and starts to efface, but the baby doesn't really descend um, very much during the latent phase. Um, for a prima gravita, it averages about eight and a half hours, but typically won't go beyond 20 hours time. And then for a multipara, so somebody like me who's had four kids, um, it will average around five hours and typically won't go past 14. So you can see labor lasts a um, long um, especially in this beginning phase of the first stage. In the latent phase, the mom has the ability to cope well. She might have some anxiety going on about how things are going to progress or turn out in the end, but she's excited during this phase. Um, I like to call this the Facebook, uh, Snapchat, and Instagram phase of labor because they're able to do that. They are excited. They want everybody to know they're in the hospital, so they're taking snaps and sending them around. Um, they're letting their friends and their family know, hey, I'm here and it's happening. In the active phase of labor, contractions become moderate to strong. The mom is four to seven centimeters dilated and the contractions now are coming about every two to five minutes and they're anywhere from 40 to 60 seconds long. So this phase is a little shorter in time, anywhere from a round and a half to four and a half hours. Um, and things start to get a little more stressful for mom. She's in more pain um, and that pain is much frequent with less rest. So she has anxiety, she has a sense of need for energy, um, she has a, she senses the need to focus, she fears a loss of control and senses sometimes a little bit of hopelessness because of not being able to control these contractions that are going on. Um, and she has a sense of purpose. She needs to regroup herself to focus on the task at hand. Um, I would like to mention that your book will probably have some differences when it comes to uh, dilation. 
and um, regarding the phases. Um, but for the purposes of this class, we're just going to stick. Um, we're just going to stick with what I have in this PowerPoint. So zero to three and four to seven for active phase. Um, fetal descent in the active phase, unlike the latent phase, is progressive. So you can actually, on a sterile vaginal exam, now start to feel the station of that presenting part start to increase. So we might move from a minus two to zero station, from zero station to plus one. Um, the baby starts to descend into the pelvis. And again, contractions are more frequent, they're longer in duration, and they increase in intensity. So that, so that mom has to um, get a handle on herself, and she senses that need to focus, and she regroups herself. Because she needs it in the transition phase. In the transition phase, uterine contractions are extremely strong. So again, like you're like your forehead, if you are palpating mom's baby, um, she is around eight to 10 centimeters dilated. Her contractions are coming now every one and a half to two minutes. They're around 60 to 90 seconds long. So they're, la they're coming more frequently and they're lasting for a longer period of time. Um, typically the transition phase is over pretty quickly things move kind of fast through the transition phase, fast compared to the latent and the active phase. Um, so uh, usually it's less than an hour and can range up to three hours. Um, and that's the same for the second stage of labor too, which we'll talk about next. Um, so this is the last phase of the first stage of labor. I like to call this the get it over, get it out phase. Moms are um, have an awareness of need for energy. They are focused on the task at hand. They may feel very anxious. They may feel out of control. They're starting to become very tired. They're restless. They have frequent changes in position because they can't get comfortable. Um, their behaviors are more directed um, inward. So they are focused on themselves. They are not going to be nice to people. They, they really need the support of their partner during the transition phase, but they probably aren't going to be very nice to him or to you as the labor nurse. Um, they will show an increase in vaginal discharge or that bloody show because their cervix really starts to, to, um, approach that complete dilation, they have a severe need to bear down or push. But remember that they shouldn't be doing that until they're completely dilated and effaced. So labor nurse support during the first stage of the transition phase is extremely important, encouraging that mom to breathe appropriately so that she doesn't um, bear down and push and start to swell that cervix. Um, as her uh, dilation approaches um, 10 centimeters, that she's, she's going to start to feel increased rectal pressure and that desire to bear down and push will be almost unbearable if she does not have some medication. So it, again, support from the labor nurse is key. And encouragement. Um, you don't leave your patient's side whenever they're in the transition phase. You are by their bedside constantly. Um, you also might see um, rupture of membranes occur during this time um, if that has not already happened because the uterine contractions are so strong at this point. Um, you're, you'll, you will probably find a spontaneous rupture of membranes if it has not already happened. Um, the woman during the transition phase is usually so tired and exhausted um, that she may even have sort of this sense of amnesia between contractions um, and she may even sleep during that resting period between contractions because she is so exhausted. Um, 
their support people feel very tired and their support people feel helpless. Um, so it's important to also, uh oh, sorry guys. Um, <clears throat> so it's also important to make sure that you are keeping the support people in mind, um, that you're not only supporting the mom, but you're supporting her support person as well. So moving on to the second stage, that occurs from complete dilation until the birth of the baby. So from 10 centimeters until the birth. This is also known as the pushing stage, that urge to bear down and that feeling of pressure in their perineal area is um, extreme during this point. And that's what, um, and the purpose of that is to give their body the, the need and the urge to bear down to expel the fetus. Um, typically, the contractions are around the same as they are in the transition phase of labor. Um, and the second stage can last anywhere from less than 10, less than 15 minutes to up to three hours. We would not typically have a mom uh, push longer than three hours. If she cannot deliver a baby um, in the second stage within a three hour time period, she probably would have a C-section because it's so exhausting. Um, crowning happens during the second stage. So that's where you can see the fetal head start to emerge from the introitus. Um, and when you see that, you know that birth is imminent. It is getting ready to happen. Again, bloody show starts to increase, so you get more and more vaginal secretions at this point. And the cardinal movements of labor occur here in the second stage. Um, you don't have to know all the cardinal movements, um, but you just should know that they occur here at this point, which means the fetus moves in a certain manner to make its way through the birth canal. Um, for a prima gravida, um, this stage should be completed, um, again, like I said, around, around three hours. And in a multipara, it may take less than 15 minutes because they're experienced um, and they just have the hang of it. They just know what to do. Um, you will see and be able to feel on vaginal exam the des descent of the fetal presenting part until it reaches the perineal floor, which is when you start to see crowning. And again, as that head descends, the more and the more it descends, the woman has that strong urge to push. Um, the perineum will begin to bulge and flatten. It'll move sort of anteriorly towards the pelvis and there is an increasingly severe pain and a burning sensation as the perineum starts to descend and the fetal head starts to move through that. Um, you'll hear people refer to it as the ring of fire. Um, the burning and the pressure sensation at this point overwhelms the pain of contractions because it's so focused in one area. Um, the, and, and because of that, the mom may feel a relief, actually, that the transition phase is over, um, that birth is near, and now she can actually push to sort of take care of some of this pain and pressure. Um, so sometimes getting to this point is a relief. Um, she feels a, a renewed sense of purpose now that she can be actively involved and do something about it. And so she's very focused and the labor nurse should encourage her to, you know, use all of her energy and um, focus that into pushing during contractions. We should encourage them to rest between those contractions and you may find they even fall asleep because they're so tired. Um, for women who, who don't have any preparation or have never had a baby before, this part of uh, labor can be very frightening for them um, and it can also be very frightening for the support person so um, if they've never experienced it so keeping an eye on your partner 
can also be very important because sometimes they'll pass out. So you gotta be prepared. Um, the nurse can help the support person by letting them um, help perform different activities that can help the mom. Like if she needs to hold her legs back, you can put the partner on one side of the bed and help um, encourage the partner to help her hold her legs back. The partner can be responsible for giving her some ice chips between contractions or getting her a cool rag for her head, fanning her if she's hot. Um, so letting them be involved is really helpful for them. Um, if they're able to, to stomach it, some people can't. Um, but offering encouragement that they're doing the right thing for mom helps. <clears throat> and again, in the second stage, these moms can tend to be a little mean um, to their partner or to the nurse. They can be very forceful about what they want to say um, because they are in pain. And um, sometimes in rare cases, women don't have that overwhelming urge to push or bear down and in cases like that um, the nurse's guidance is key so think about someone who is paralyzed who might not have that urge to bear down or somebody who has a, a really good epidural and they're not feeling that pressure um, the nurse is the key person to help them push at the right time So this slide shows you the cardinal movements or the mechanisms of labor and um, they are descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, restitution, external rotation, and expulsion. Um, again, you don't have to know all of those, um, but sometimes I think it's helpful to kind of see how the baby moves through the birth canal um, and out. and uh, what you're seeing here and what you hope happens is a spontaneous birth from a vertex presentation. Um, just in simple terms, what happens is that the perineum becomes extremely thin. The anus starts to stretch and protrude in a woman who is going through these cardinal movements. Um, the head will extend under the mom's symphysis pubis as it's born and um, gentle, a gentle push by the mom aids in the birth of the shoulders and then the rest of the body just kind of follows. In the third stage of labor, um, we consider this as being from the point of the birth of the newborn until the delivery of the placenta. And normally this happens within 30 minutes time of the baby being born. And if not, then a retained placenta is um, thought to have happened. There are two phases that happen in the third stage. There are uh, placental separation and there is a delivery of the placenta. Um, and this says five signs of separation, but it's actually four. So there's a globular shaped uterus. So the uterus will be more globular. There is a fundal rise within the abdomen that the nurse can actually see and feel or the physician. There's a gush or a trickle of blood from the vaginal opening as the placenta starts to separate and the umbilical cord will start to extend more and more from the vagina. Um, so those are things that you can assess and that you should see that lets you know placental separation is happening. Um, and once those things have occurred, placental delivery happens. And uh, the placenta delivers either one of two ways. It delivers on the Schultz side which is the side that is closest to the baby when the mom is when the when the fetus is in utero and if the Schultz side delivers that means the placenta has separated from the middle portion to the outer edges however if it delivers the Duncan side up which is the side that is um, implanted into the endometrium 
were implanted into the uterus, so that's the maternal side. Um, that means that the placenta has separated from the edges into the middle. Usually these signs of placental separation that you can assess occur within five minutes of the baby being delivered. Um, and when placental separation occurs, the uterus contracts itself very firmly to help with that separation. Um, and the membranes are the last thing that separate. Um, during delivery, the woman may need to be encouraged to bear down to help aid um, the delivery of the placenta, but she only needs to bear down um, very lightly. It's not like a, a big push she would give to deliver the baby. It's just a small little push. So you may have to encourage her to bear down. Um, if the placenta is not separating or the mom can't bear down, the physician can put a gentle traction to uh, the umbilical cord, meaning he can gently pull the umbilical cord while he also presses on the lower uterine segment to kind of help aid that separation. And so one way that you can remember uh, which side of the placenta delivers first or, or delivers face up is by saying shiny Schultz, which is this one, or dirty Duncan. And uh, we do document that. So the plus, we would document placenta delivered at 11.55 a.m. Uh, Schultz side or Duncan side. During the fourth stage of labor, this you can think of as the recovery phase. Um, this is when the mom starts the physiologic process of readjusting back to normal. Um, it happens anywhere from one to four hours after birth. Um, and typically during this time, the mom will lose a lot of blood, anywhere from 250 to 500 milliliters of blood loss. And remember that when you have blood loss greater than 500, you start seeing signs of hypovolemic shock. So we're continually during this fourth stage assessing our mom for um, hypovolemic shock, the you know, decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, increased respirations. And we're also rubbing the fundus to make sure the uterus is staying nice and firm. We're checking bleeding. Um, we're assessing for clots or hematomas. We're doing our whole bubble he, that bubble he assessment with a specific focus on the uterine and vaginal areas. Fundal massage is very important. Um, the mom may be thirsty or hungry. Typically, they are. Um, and bladder assessment is also really important during the fourth stage because um, due to the descent of the fetus during the other stages of labor and pushing uh, the baby coming through the birth canal, sometimes it can cause a little trauma to the bladder and the bladder is sort of in shock after fetal delivery, so it may become hypotonic and not, um, if a, and if a bladder becomes hypotonic, then the mother will not have the urge to pee. So if you're noticing on assessment that the bladder is getting full and your mom cannot urinate, you may have to do an in and out cath to empty her bladder because we know that as the bladder continues to fill up, it will push the uterus up and out of place um, and not allow that contraction of the uterus that we want to happen in order to prevent bleeding. So urinary retention is very bad in um, a postpartum woman. Um, so, so from a physiologic standpoint, what happens in the fourth stage is that um, maternal blood is redistributed into her venous system. Um, there is a moderate drop in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. 
She will have an increased pulse and she'll have some moderate tachycardia. She's just worked very hard and now we've got a lot of blood that's being redistributed around the body. Um, her uterus should remain contracted in the midline of her abdomen and the vessels at the site of where um, placental implantation was um, should constrict to stop that bleeding. Um, and if they don't, then you're going to see lots of lochia, maybe clots. Um, nausea and vomiting during this time usually stop. So moms are not as nauseated or they don't have vomiting like they might have. Um, and another thing that happens in the fourth stage that's pretty common is called um, the labor shakes. And for uh, whatever reason, moms will have this shaking chill that happens after delivery of the placenta. And um, it usually doesn't last very long, but offering them a warm blanket or um, just reassuring them that things are okay, that it's a normal thing, um, is important. So, from a systemic response, uh, what happens? So let's let's look at all of these different maternal systems and what happens after labor and birth or during labor and birth. <clears throat> so during labor and delivery, the cardiovascular system is stressed out. It is stressed out because of contractions, because of the pain that mom is feeling, and even anxiety. Cardiac output increases by 10 to 15 percent. There is an increase in blood pressure and heart rate in the respiratory rate and um, cardiac output can be affected by maternal positioning. So remember lying on the left side is the best way to increase cardiac output. Lying flat on mom's back during labor and delivery could cause maternal supine hypotension syndrome which might could affect the baby and definitely would affect cardio, um, cardiac output. Um, so why all this increase in cardiac output? Why does that happen? And the reason is because whenever a contraction happens, about 300 to 500 milliliters of blood volume gets forced back into the maternal circulation because of the increased pressure in the uterus and the placental area when that contraction occurs. So that's why we have that um, increase in cardiac output, which in turn affects all of the other things, blood pressure, heart rate, respirations. Um, lying supine, again, would, will decrease that cardiac output and having the mom lie in a lateral position can increase it. <clears throat> From a respiratory standpoint, moms have an increase in oxygen demand because of uterine contractions. They have an increase in anxiety and pain because of those uterine contractions. They have, an, um, and that in turn leads to increased oxygen consumption, potential hyperventilation. Um, so they end up with a decreased level of CO2. Um, they're in a respiratory alkalotic state because of that. And that compensates for what happens in the first stage of labor, which is a mild metabolic acidosis. Um, and the reason that metabolic acidosis occurs is because um, as contractions happen, um, serum lactate starts to build up and uh, carbon dioxide will increase, but that's all from a, a metabolic point. So we have this whole compensatory mechanism that starts working. Um, usually about 24 hours after delivery, the acid base levels in a mom will start to return back to normal. So you'll see um, what would be closer to what you would expect on a normal assessment. Um, you also have to remember in the pushing stage or the second stage of labor to be really careful to ask moms not to hold their breath because if they do hold their breath, we're gonna end up with an increase in that carbon dioxide and serum lactate levels. And then we're gonna end up with some um, respiratory acidosis 
um, and if that's uncompensated, then we can then it can lead to other problems. Okay, so the renal system um, during labor and delivery has an increase in renin level, an increase in plasma renin activity, and an increase in angiotensin tensinogen level. And we think this is important um, in controlling the utero-placental blood flow during labor and delivery and postpartum. Um, it's important for the baby to have plenty of oxygen during those contractions. So if we can increase um, some of those levels, then um, potentially we can increase that, um, increase blood flow and increase oxygenation. Um, Moms may not have an urge, again, to void during labor and delivery and possibly afterwards because of a displaced bladder or hypotonia that occurs um, due to the descent of the baby into the pelvis. Um, when engagement happens, it actually will push the base of the bladder forward so we're even changing the placement of where things are from a bladder standpoint. Um, and that can be problematic if the bladder gets too full of urine. So we're always needing to offer our mom the opportunity to go to the bathroom every couple of hours during labor and um, even probably more frequently after delivery. Pressure also. Um, from the baby descending into the pelvis might impair blood and lymph drainage from the base of the bladder and that could also cause some edema. From a gastrointestinal standpoint there's a decrease in gastric mo mobility and absorption of solid foods so nausea and vomiting is um, not out of the question for these people when that's one reason why we typically don't allow them to eat solid foods or uh, anything that's not a clear liquid during labor and delivery and usually um, we don't even really allow them to eat clear liquids but they could have sips of water um, ice chips and popsicles um, we can do popsicles and uh, you know, so why why do you think this happens? And the answer is that as gastric emptying time um, is prolonged due to the decrease in gastric motility and absorption of food, there is an increased gastric volume in the mom's gastrointestinal system. And so that can lead to the nausea and the vomiting. Um, also, women get pain medicines sometimes during labor, <clears throat> and narcotics can actually delay gastric emptying even more. So we have to be extra careful with those patients. Our immune system during labor and delivery will increase its white blood cell count somewhere to between 20 and 20, um, 25 and 30,000 during labor and early postpartum period and that just has to do with a neutrophil, in, a neutrophil increase from the stress of labor. It doesn't mean that mom has an infection, it just means that labor and delivery process has stressed her body out and increased those white blood cell counts. Um, so it's important to watch that lab work, that post-delivery lab work and ensure that it's within an acceptable level of what her levels were when she came in. We, we doesn't mean we need to start her on any antibiotics unless they're astronomically different or astronomically increased. Um, so, and because of this increase, it can sometimes be difficult to determine if they have a true infection. So we always want to pair that lab work with other assessments um, at the bedside. So does mom have fever? Um, if she had a C-section, is her incision red and inflamed? If she had an episiotomy, um, remember the RETA assessment on the perineum. Um, 
And then other blood values that are important to worry about are things like blood glucose levels. We know that after delivery, maternal blood glucose levels, and, and actually during labor, um, blood glucose levels will decrease because the mom is utilizing all of those glucose stores to help get her through the labor process. Um, and so there's going to be a decrease in insulin requirements as a result of that. So if you have a mom who is taking insulin, um, um, so you've got a type 1 diabetic who is requiring a certain amount of insulin during pregnancy, now those glucose levels in her body are going to decrease because she's using them up for labor. Um, and they'll, they'll be decreased afterwards. So we would not probably want to give her as much insulin during the labor process or even after delivery because the, the requirements for insulin have decreased because they're using all of that. <clears throat> and then uh, on the flip side of that, after delivery, um, remember, the maternal system starts to move back towards um, a back towards a normal level. So, if you think back to the endocrine system and how that changes during pregnancy, um, remember that the baby uses a lot of glucose, and insulin resistance increases in um, in a normal maternal mom, so that the babies can use that glucose store to help. Those glu that all the glucose to uh, grow. Um, once the baby is born, the, that insulin resistance starts to decrease. So again, there will be a decrease in what's needed from an insulin requirement standpoint. The integumentary system during labor and delivery. Um, you're going to notice things like the patient's hot, they're flushed, they might be sweaty. So we can offer ice chips, a fan, um, we can uh, give them a cool rag, all of those things to help those discomforts. Um, from a musculoskeletal system standpoint, uh, there's a hormone called relaxin that is excreted by the mom. And this helps to allow the bones to soften up and become flexible. So the symphysis pubis and where the joint is right there in the middle of the symphysis pubis and the coccyx joints, it allows those to begin to soften and be able to move a little as the baby descends through the, pa the passageway. And then pain is a huge uh, a huge component of labor and delivery. And so what causes pain during labor? Um, and uh, the causes differ based on the stages of labor. There are physiological processes that make pain levels change and the type of pain change from stage to stage. So in the first stage, pain comes from um, the dilation of the cervix. That's the primary source of pain. Um, also, the lower uterine segment starts to stretch as the baby begins to come down and as the, um, as the contractions begin to get more frequent, um, there's pressure on mom's um, adjacent structures such as her hips, um, the pelvic structures, and then hypoxia from the uterine contractions also occur and that creates pain. Um, in the second stage, you still have that hypoxia from the contraction, um, kind of contraction of the uterine muscles, which continue the pain um, in that area. But also at this point now, the vagina and the perineum starts to descend. There's more pressure on the adjacent structures of the pelvis. Um, so they complain more about a localized pain kind of in the perineum. In the third stage, which remember is uh, when the placenta is delivered from birth until delivery of the placenta, there are still uterine contractions and uh, cervical dilation is complete by then, but still the placenta has to come through that cervix. <clears throat> 
it's really important for the for the nurse to know uh, what type of factors affect your patient's response to pain. So um, teaching your mom what to expect, knowing techniques for each stage that can help them increase their comfort level for the stage of labor they're in, making sure that what you're offering is culturally appropriate to that person. Um, and and also knowing from a cultural standpoint how they respond to pain. Are they stoic responders? Are they uh, a little more dramatic? What is culturally appropriate for where they come from? Um, knowing that fatigue and being tired also contribute to how they experience pain. What's their previous experience? Have they done this before or not? Um, when the sensation of pain is their focused is their focus of attention. They perceive that pain to be of greater intensity. So sometimes getting their focus off of that pain is helps. So distractions can help them refocus on something instead of the pain. Um, making sure the port per support person is there by their side um, can also decrease their um, perception of pain and making sure that there is consistent um, comfort measures and support in place can help to shorten their duration of labor. It can decrease the, their need for um, pain meds and anesthesia and also it actually will reduce the rate of them having to have a C-section.